my guilt and pride Blood of Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you Well, we've been commanded in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 to sorrow not as the rest who have no hope. He's talking about if you're sorrowing for someone who is a brother, somebody who's in the kingdom, he said, don't, don't sorrow for them because he goes on to say that when the Lord returns, he's going to bring these people with him. And he tells us to sorrow not as the rest who have no hope. In other words, they don't have any hope of the resurrection. They don't have any hope to see their loved ones again. He said, sorrow not as the rest. That's what's natural. The rest. Who have no hope. Uh, so he doesn't want us to sorrow like the world sorrows. There can be a sorrow, just not a sorrow like the world sorrows. Let me talk to you about the rest, okay? Look at uh, Matthew 11 and, and verse 28. Talk about the rest a little bit. God wants us to rest. He don't want us to live like the world uh, in bondage to our emotions. That's the problem. Matthew 11, 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, the rest comes from Jesus. He is the rest. The Word is the rest. And Jesus was the Word made flesh. The Word is what brings us into the rest of God. He said, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Rest unto your souls. And the word here is the same word for Sabbath rest in the scriptures, you know. And he said, take my yoke upon you. You know, and a, a yoke, a zugos, was a, a yoke that coupled two animals together. When he's saying, take my yoke upon you, he's saying, you get in the same yoke that I'm in, and I'll pull for you, you know. Um, a zugos was a pair of animals, and it was also a thing that yoked two animals together. The name meant the same thing. And so he said when he wants us to put the yoke on him that's on, he wants us to put the yoke on us that's upon him so that he can pull for us. You know, he says because that's what they did. You know what they did? They put a weaker animal in with a stronger animal. The stronger animal would do most of the pulling. You know, he says take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy my burden is light. You know, the next chapter goes on to talk about what is really the rest. You know, they begin to, uh, the Pharisees begin to uh, come against Jesus because he and his disciples were working on the Sabbath. They weren't entering into what they called the rest, you know. And he says, at that time, at that season, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the grain fields, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck ears and to eat. But the Pharisees, when they saw it, said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath. So they were correcting them with the law, you see. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and they that were with him, how that he entered into the house of God and ate the showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat? Neither for them, in other words, Jesus is admitting this was not lawful according to the law, right? Okay. Neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath day, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? So, you know, the Bible says in, uh, I believe it's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, it says that we're a kingdom of priests. We have sacrifices. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us we have sacrifices to offer. And uh, Jesus is, of course, our high priest. But we as priests all have sacrifices to offer. But he said the priests in the temple profaned the Sabbath and were guiltless. Why? Because in the temple they were doing the work of God. The work of God is not the work of man. We are supposed to be ceasing from our own works. You know, living after, and one thing, living after the bondage to our own emotions. We should be able to overcome that. We need to be able to overcome the grief that the world is in bondage to or any other emotion that the world is in bondage to. 
We're not to serve our emotions. Our emotions are to serve us. Okay? Well, a priest in the temple, he profanes the Sabbath, but he's guiltless. Now look at the parallel he draws. He said, but I say unto you, one greater than the temple is here. You know what he was he was applying himself to the temple. He was comparing himself to the temple. If the priests in the temple did the work of God and they didn't break the Sabbath, then guess what those who abide in Christ do? They do the work of God and they don't break the Sabbath. They are guiltless from the law of the Sabbath. See, so abiding in Christ, you see, everybody see what I'm talking about? If you're abiding in Christ, you are keeping the Sabbath. He is the New Testament temple. The priests in the temple, they did all of the work of God abiding in that temple, and they were totally guiltless. Us, when we walk in our temple and we abide in our temple and do the work of God, the work that God has given us to do in our temple, we're guiltless. We don't break the Sabbath. He went on to say, he said, but if you had known what this meaneth, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So if you're obeying the Son of Man, you're keeping the Sabbath. See that? Everybody wants to put the Sabbath as a day. But if they're rebelling against Jesus and not walking in Jesus and not being obedient and being a disciple of Jesus, they are breaking the Sabbath. If they make it a day. There's not one place in the New Testament that makes the Sabbath a day. Saturday or Sunday. There's no place in there like that. But Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. If you're serving Jesus, you are keeping the Sabbath. And you are ceasing from your works. Right? You know, he, he went on to um, heal a man with a withered hand. And, of course, they were t trying him to see if he would do something on the Sabbath. And... Uh, he said to them in verse 12, he said, Wherefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. In other words, to do the work of God. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. So it's always lawful to do good. And if you're doing something that's not good, that's not lawful. And it's not abiding in Christ, and it's not keeping the Sabbath, you see? Look at Hebrews chapter 3. And look in verse, um, excuse me, chapter 4. In, in verse 9, in order to keep the Sabbath perfectly, we have to renew our mind. Because how can two walk together except they be agreed? You can't walk with Christ. You can't be yoked with Christ if your thinking is contrary. Because half the time you're going to be working for the world and the devil, and part of the time you're going to be working for Christ, you see. So to the extent you renew your mind, to that extent you can keep the Sabbath. You can enter into his rest. He calls it his rest. The Lord designed the, the word and the promises of the word that if you believe them and you obey them, you will automatically walk into his rest. And the rest is rest indeed. You know what? When you enter into God's rest, you're not blown about by every wind of doctrine and you're not blown about by every wind of the emotions and you're not blown about by the things that you see. You're just as steady as a rock. Verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore Sabbath rest. Now some Bibles, there's two Bibles that I know of that don't have Sabbath rest here. That is the King James and the Living Bible. And I think all the rest of them have Sabbath rest here. I can say this now, there is not any manuscripts that don't say Sabbath rest. So why they just put rest in the King James or in the Living Bible, I don't understand. Because there's no foundation for it. The, the, the uh, ancient manuscripts have Sabbath rest. The received text has Sabbath rest. It should be Sabbath rest. Because when people read this, they need to understand that now God is talking about this New Testament rest. It's not a day. He didn't say... There remaineth therefore a Sabbath day's rest. He said a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For he that hath entered into his rest hath himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So keeping the rest is ceasing from your old works. Keeping, ceasing from your, your, the works of the law, ceasing from the works of the flesh, 
Isn't that true? Because when you're abiding in Christ, you're not walking after the lust of the flesh, and you're not under the law. Because if you're under the law, you're separated from Christ. So Jesus is our New Testament Sabbath. And I might also say that the Word, because the, Jesus was the Word made flesh. The Word is our New Testament Sabbath. Because when you believe this Word and obey this Word, you enter into rest. It takes all of the burden off of you and puts it all upon God, as we'll see in just a minute. Uh, but I think he identifies here, he puts two words together for us here, so that you can identify this word rest in the rest of the Bible. Cataposis is the word rest here. But he couples it with Sabbath. Uh, sab sabbatismos is the word. He couples it with Sabbath. So when you find this word cataposis in the rest of the Bible, or anaposis in the rest of the Bible, you will find that that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the Sabbath rest. It, since Colossians tells us, Paul told us in Colossians, that not to let anybody judge you in respect of meats or days or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come. A set, the, the Sabbath of the Old Testament was a shadow of the things to come. Now he's explaining it, okay? And he says in verse 11, Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. So if you're disobedient, you're not resting. Okay? There's a reason why people are disobedient. There's a reason why people in the New Testament who want to follow God are disobedient. Let me show you that reason. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that were disobedient. Now, we, we understand that, right? Because being obedient is abiding in Christ. He's the temple. And you can't be a priest serving in the temple doing the works of God, because that's what they did in the temple, keeping the Sabbath, unless you're obedient. So he says they were disobedient. It, it says in verse 19, it says, we sh and we see that they were not able to, look, not able to enter in because of unbelief. They're not able to enter in because of unbelief. You don't have the ability to obey if you don't believe what God says. You can believe many things. You can believe Religious phrases, you can believe a lot of religious thinking, but if you believe what God says, you will have the ability to enter in. Because when you believe, actually, let me tell you the truth, the word apithia in the Hebrew is the same word for both, believe and obey. You can't believe and disobey. <laughs> the apostle said, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, I'll prove to you I've got faith by my works. Faith is not complete without works. If you don't have works, it's not real faith. Real faith gets into our actions. Real faith is moving, you see. So he says, but what he's saying here is clear, and the way they translate it is right too. It says that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. In other words, they weren't able to obey and to do because they weren't believing. Watch this now. He says, Let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into the rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. What does he mean, a promise being left? Well, God's promises, plural, are the thing that causes us to enter into rest. In other words, Promises in many different areas of our life bring us into parts of the rest. And what he wants us to do is not leave out any of his promises, but enter into his rest in every area in our life. So that's why he says, let us fear, therefore, lest happily a promise being left of entering into his rest. We don't want to leave any of his promises out. We don't want to reject any of God's promises. We want to enter into God's rest in every area, right? We don't want to come short of God's rest in any area. For indeed, we have had good tidings 
preached unto us, even as also they. But the word of hearing did not profit them, because it was not united by faith with them that heard. So you can read the word, read the word, read the word, quote the word, enjoy listening to the word, all those things. But if you don't mix faith with the word, it won't profit you. It's mixing faith with the word that causes you to enter into God's rest and keep his Sabbath. Okay? Verse 3. For we who have believed are entering into that rest, is what it says in the original. We who have believed are entering into that rest, even as he has said. As I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. All of the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Well, you know, that their trial, the trial that they went through is just like the trial that we're going through. Okay? Go back to chapter 3 and verse 7. Let me show you something. We, our, our trial is with the voice of God. Okay? He says in verse 7, Wherefore, even as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, like as in the day of the trial in the wilderness. So this is what he's saying to us as Christians. We're in this trial in the wilderness. And if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart to his voice. The trial is, what are we going to do with his voice? What are we going to do with what we hear that comes from God? Are we going to believe and obey? Because you can't rest without believing and subsequently obeying. See, if you're, unless you're not, unless you're obeying God, you're not disobeying the flesh. You haven't ceased from your own works unless you're doing God's works. You're either do, doing one or the other, as Jesus said. You're either with me or you're against me. In everything that we do, we're either with him or against him. So we have to renew our minds with the word. We have a we have a, a warfare to accomplish, according to Second Corinthians chapter five. I'm going to explain to you how the word causes us to enter into rest. In just a minute, but I want to share this with you first. Here's here's where our warfare, Second Corinthians chapter ten and verse three. I tell you, if you do this, if you obey this, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be in turmoil. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are mighty before God, to the get casting down of strongholds. Now, where are these strongholds? Well, he said, casting down imaginations or reasonings, your Bible might say. I'm not sure what your Bible says, but. So he's talking about a stronghold in your mind, casting down imaginations or reasonings, and every high thing that's exalted against the knowledge of God. So there are things in our mind that are exalted against the knowledge of God. And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bringing every thought. This is it. This is the warfare right here. People, people have a lot of turmoil in their lives because they listen to thoughts that are not legal to listen to. They're not hearing the voice in the wilderness. They're hearing another voice. They're being disobedient. They're being obedient to a wrong voice. Push it out if it's not legal. Because what does it do? This, this, this foreign voice that comes in, first of all, it really, they really, it really loves to stir up your emotions. Once your emotions come into play, it's very hard to overcome sometimes because they're warring against you because you've listened to the wrong voice. Okay? If you're going to be obedient to God's voice, you've got to listen only to His voice. Don't listen to another voice. Cast down every reasoning or every imagination that the Bible teaches you is illegal. Okay? 
For instance, remember now, everything is not in obedience to Christ. So what does Christ teach us? Look at look for instance in Philippians chapter four. And you get out of so much trouble and so much turmoil if you just obey this. Because if you don't, the devil is going to stir up trouble in you and you're going to lose the battle. Let me read this to you. Philippians 4 and 1. Wherefore, my brethren, beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my beloved, I exhort Euodia and I exhort Sintashe to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, the Lord taught me a little something here one time. He made me look those two ladies' names up, and I come to find out that, that the Euodia means to be successful, and Sintashe means to meet with an accident. And he's telling you what he's saying here, hidden in the text, God is saying, that whether you are successful in what you're doing or whether you've met with an accident, be of the same mind. He doesn't want you moved by what has happened to you. He doesn't want you to be shaken by what has happened to you. And he doesn't want you to be ruled by your emotions by what has happened to you, okay? He says, I exhort you, I exhort Sintashe, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yea, I beseech thee also, true yoke fellow, Help these women, for they labored with me in the gospel with Clement also. And Clement means merciful. And the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now notice, notice the next few verses actually say the same thing. Watch, watch carefully. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your forbearance be known unto all men, or your restraint be known unto all men. You know, we need to be restrained. Don't have unbridled emotions. Don't let them run away with you, you know. Be restrained. Get your mind on what the Bible says and restrain your emotions because your emotions are supposed to serve your spirit and not your flesh. That's the problem, okay? We as Christians, many times, permit our flesh to run away with our emotions, okay? He says, let your forbearance or your restraint be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now watch this. If you obey this, you've got to walk in rest. He says, In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgivings, let your requests be known unto God. See, he says, Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious for anything. Just Pray and thank God. So he's telling you to pray and thank God in the same breath, even before you see the answer. See, if you obey that, you're going to stay in the rest. You know, Jesus gave us Mark 11, 23, and 24. He said, when you pray, believe you have received, and you shall have it. You know why he gave us that? He gave us those instructions about receiving things from God. And those instructions are, that when you pray, to believe right there that you receive. So that, what does that do to you when you do that? It reinforces your faith. It causes you to enter into rest immediately. In fact, if you keep on obeying that, you're going to stay in the rest. You'll never get out of the rest. Because you're never going to be anxious about what you see or what you need or what you lack. You know, we all look at ourselves and we see that we lack things. But God says he don't, doesn't want you to be anxious about that. You know, Mary just had a really, really good dream the other day about the bride. I'm just, just, just came back to me. Just, I wasn't even thinking about that. But this dream was that the bride was getting dressed up, and she didn't quite have herself all straight, and all her clothes on right and straight and everything. And she was getting anxious that people would see her in this condition and not ready to meet the Lord. And there was an attendant with the bride who said, Don't worry, don't worry. We'll fix it up. We'll get you ready. You know, <laughs> Does that sound all right? You know, sounds good, doesn't it? Don't worry. That's the only thing God's going to say to you. Fear not. It says 365 times in the Bible. Fear not. Here he says almost the same thing. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't be anxious for anything. Just pray and believe and thank God. And then he gives us instructions about our thinking. 
And he tells us what we can think and what we can't think. He tells us what's legal to think and what's not legal to think. If you disobey this, don't be surprised that you don't get yourself in trouble. You're, there are thoughts that come into your mind that you must cast down because they are not obedience to Christ. And there are thoughts that come into your mind from God, the voice of the Lord in the wilderness, that if you obey it, you will enter into rest. I want to talk to you a little more about the voice of the Lord in the wilderness, but right now let's read on down just a little bit. It says, if you, if you obey what he just said, he said, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Now that's the truth. The peace of God. Not grief, turmoil. You know, God doesn't want us to be in grief and turmoil. He wants the peace of God to rule in our hearts, knowing that God is sovereign, knowing that God knows best. All these things, you see, the truth of God helps us to be able to obey this, you see. If you understand the sovereignty of God, and you understand that he's working all things together for your good, no matter what it looks like, these things help you to enter into rest, help you to be at peace, even in a tumultuous situation, you know. Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, that's the truth, right? Truthful thoughts are legal. The words of truth are legal. Jesus is the truth. What he teaches is legal. Whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Or actually it says, take account of these things. These are the things you're supposed to be taking account of. These are the things you're supposed to be thinking on. Right? If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit into this category, cast it down. It's not obedience to Christ. That's what he says. Well, you can see that if you think on these things, you're going to have peace. Right? You're not going to be in turmoil because of what you see. You're not going to be in turmoil because of what you hear. You're not going to be in turmoil because of what Christians tell you. You're not going to be in turmoil because of what you see in yourself. You're not going to be in turmoil because of the failure that you see in yourself. See that? If you think on these things, what is the truth according to the word of God, and what is good and just according to the word of God, you're not going to, be, you're not going to step out of your peace. You're going to abide in the rest of God. Okay? So thinking has everything to do with the rest of God. You can't abide in Christ, who is the Sabbath, if you're not abiding in the Word. Get the Word in your mind, it'll take the turmoil out of your body and out of your life. You know? And the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So we can copy Paul, and the God of peace will be with us, right? He said, follow me as I follow the Lord, right? God wants the God of peace to be with us. Look at this other verse. It's in Isaiah chapter 28. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. When my daddy died, I was surprised that there was no grief in me. I really was. I, it was, it, I shocked myself. I did, there was no real grief in me like like I would have thought that there would have been, you know. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9. I'm going to show you something about this rest, okay? Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. In other words, we're talking about growing up in Christ here. We're not talking about staying a baby. We're not talking about staying with a baby's mind. We're talking about growing up in Christ. The people who get knowledge and the people who get understanding are going to have to get weaned from the milk. Okay, You can't stay on the milk. You can't grow on the milk. You're going to stay small on the milk. You've got to have meat to grow. And Jesus said his meat, he said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. So if we're going to do the will of our Father, we can't stay babies in a crib. 
and you got to get off the milk and get on the meat and able to do, and be able to do that. Now watch. He says, for it's precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. The word God is going to add to the knowledge of the person who will go on with God and not stay a baby, not stay thinking like a baby, you know. He will add precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. He's going to add to it. What is he adding when he adds this? Well, watch. He said, Nay, but my men of strange lips and with another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, This is the rest. Give you rest to him that is weary. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, you know, we're prone to use this to say, and yeah, Speaking in tongues is the rest, okay? But no, he's not really saying that. Uh, but if you add verse 9 and 10 on with verse 11, then verse 12 makes more sense, you know? The, pro the truth is that the word is the rest. Abiding in Christ is the rest. Abiding in the truth and being obedient to the truth is the rest, okay? Uh, the speaking in tongues is a great help in abiding in the rest. There's no doubt in my mind. The Holy Spirit is one who comes to give us power to abide in the rest. Speaking in tongues, a man who speaks in tongues edifies himself. He builds himself up. The Bible says building yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit. So praying in the Holy Spirit builds you up in the faith. It gives you faith. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It's a good gift, okay? But if you connect 9 and 10 with 11, you begin to see that it's the Word. The Holy Spirit enables us and empowers us and builds us up to be obedient to the Word, to hear the Word. You know that the Spirit-filled people hear the Word so much better than the people who are not Spirit-filled. If you don't look, believe it, look at the denominations and you'll be able to see the ones who are filled with the Spirit are a lot closer to the truth than the ones who are not. Because the Holy Spirit comes to lead us and guide us in all truth. And he comes to be our comforter, right? That's rest. That's peace, right? Okay? Um, go back over. Let me go. Go to uh, 1 Peter. Let me share something with you. Let me show you why the Word causes us to rest. If you just believe the Word and act in agreement with the Word, you have to rest. You have to rest. Like we read there in Philippians chapter 4. If you obey that, if you think those thoughts that are legal, don't think those thoughts that are not legal, Christ is always going to keep you in the rest. His burden is light, he said. He said, get yoked up with him. Walk with him. Because his burden is light. Okay? Let me show you an example. Or if you can get this down in your heart, God will show you how to rest. You know that everything that has to do with our sacrifice and what Jesus did for us is past tense. Okay? For example, this is the key to God's power. This rest is the key to God's power. You can't be anxious and troubled and be walking in God's power and be receiving God's blessings because there's no faith in that. Okay? First uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. To just point out to you just a few verses here. He said, Who his own self bear our sins in his body upon the tree. He bear our sins in his body upon the tree. It's past tense. If you, if you believe it, it makes you rest. He took every sin, contrary to popular opinion and popular teaching, he took every sin, past, present, and future from you, and he put it on that tree. All of your sins, and he put them on that tree. Okay? It makes you rest. It does this too. Think about this now. Not only does it make you rest, it gives you authority over sin in your life. When you believe what this says, you rest from any kind of anxiety or fear, and it gives you authority over sin. Because you can say to sin, Jesus bore you on the cross. Therefore, I've got total authority over you. Because you've been born on the cross. We've been given authority over sin. The Christian that doesn't believe that doesn't believe the gospel. Okay? 
but it's there. It's past tense. So there's really nothing we can do to get rid of sin if we believe this promise. If we believe this promise and we work in our own works to get rid of sin, then we didn't believe the promise, we didn't enter into the rest. Okay? He says, having died in the sins, that we, having died in the sins, might live unto righteousness, and by whose stripes you were healed. We don't have to struggle to get healed. We have to struggle not to struggle. Our problem is we need to struggle to not struggle. We don't have to struggle to get healed. We get all worried about what does God want me to do? Where does he want me to go? Who does he want me to want to pray for me? We don't, that's all our works. All That's our thinking and our works. We don't have to struggle to get healed. The Bible says, by his stripes you were healed. Therefore, if you believe that, you can enter into rest. You can cease from your struggling. You don't have to work at it anymore. You don't have to be fearful anymore. People who are fearful about gaining healing do not believe the promise. They have not entered into the rest because they don't believe the promise. Healing is in the rest. You know what? When they entered into the land of rest, they got rest from all their enemies. That's what the Bible says. When the Israelites entered into the land of rest, they ceased from their works. They, they rested from all of their enemies. You know why? Because the enemy can't come against you in the rest. When you're in the rest, you're destroying every power he has. His power is to speak to you with a voice that's not the voice of God in the wilderness. And if you don't listen to that voice, he's got no power. He's got power if you listen to that voice. If you listen to a voice other than the voice of God, he's got power. That's why the Bible tells us that our warfare is not according to the flesh. No, but you see, what we're looking at is two types there. And those two types interlap, you know. When you go into the wilderness and you cease in the trial in the wilderness, you're entering into the rest. It's just that God had to show it to us in a parable in a sequence, you see. You know, we, in our life, we may be entering into the rest in some areas of our life, and other areas in our life we're not entering in, because, and the reason we're not entering in is we're not believing the promises. That's why he said, fear, lest there be a promise left of us entering in. God wants us to enter into all of his rest. Why? Because that way we can totally and perfectly abide in Christ. If you believe God's promises, you're abiding in Christ. You're believing the word. You're acting upon the word. You're walking with him because you're in agreement with him, you see. That's the Sabbath. So that's why that's why all the promises that are concerning the sacrifice, they're past tense. They're past tense on purpose. That's why Jesus told us, when you pray, believe you have received, and you shall have it. If you believe you have received, you know what? You're going to stop praying. You're going to stop being worried about it. You're going to stop being anxious about it. You're just going to receive it. And you're going to back up. In fact, some people say, say they feel guilty. I, I've had the same thought. And they've had, I've had people ask me, is it wrong to just pray and just forget about it? <laughs> I said, no, it's not wrong to pray and just forget about it. If you pray and just believe that it's done there, that's a, reason, that's a good reason for forgetting about that problem and going on to the next one. Well, listen, let me, you shouldn't feel guilty. If you, if you pray again, it's because you didn't believe the first time. You need to pray again. <laughs> You know, when you don't believe, when you don't agree with the Word the first time, first of all, you should base your prayer on the Word. If you're basing it upon the Word, and you're trusting in what's been done at the cross, then you can stop, you can enter into rest, and you can cease, you know. But if, you, if it comes back up in your mind again, and you get to looking at the circumstances, then you feel a need to pray again, because you didn't feel like the first one helped you any. And that's true. If you, if you do feel like you have to pray again because the first one didn't help you, then you didn't believe the first time. Go ahead and pray again. It's okay. But, you know, the thing is, we need to learn to enter into rest. If you know how to do it and you know how to enter into rest, then you can pray one time and you can go on to other prayers that you're not settled on. Just go on to other prayers. Go on to other things. You can forget about that. God has, has answered that prayer according to his word. When you pray, believe you have received and you shall have it. That's what he said. And he means that. 
You don't have to worry about that again. You can go on to something else. I agree. Sometimes we're praying for things as they come up. You know, give us this day our daily bread. We don't need to pray for our yearly bread. You know, we pray for our daily bread. We, we pray for things as they come up. We don't have to look too far ahead. Jesus said tomorrow, let tomorrow take care of itself. Don't worry about the future. You know, many, many people get into trouble because they worry about the future and they're praying about things that haven't even happened. Many people pray about things that are never going to happen. And they worry about things, 99% of the things that people worry about never come to pass. And they never even would come to pass. So he says, don't worry about the future. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Worry about what's right in front of you. Pray about, let me show you a couple more. Uh, for instance, 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you three verses. And all of them are chapter 1, verse 3, okay? 2 Peter 1 and 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It has granted in this. Now you really don't have to besiege heaven. And and Jesus according to Jesus, you're not going to be heard by for your much speaking. Some people think, well maybe you didn't hear me. I'm just going to talk a little louder, a little longer, or I'm going to pray for an hour about this thing, yeah. You know? You're trying to earn your salvation. You don't have to earn your salvation. People that teach that don't understand grace. You don't have to do that. Simple prayer to God, prayers of faith, are effectual. Effectual, fervent prayer, that's all it's necessary. Right. And, and it, it doesn't, you don't have to pray for an hour. You don't have to pray for a week. You don't have to pray for a year. You can trust God. God doesn't want you wasting your time praying about the same thing over and over and over and over and over. You don't want that. There are many things that he wants us to pray about. And he wants us to pray about them. He says, you have not because you ask not. He said, pray that your joy may be full. He wants us to ask. He said, all things that you ask the Father, I will do them. You know? So he says here in 1 and 3, that God's already given us everything that pertains to the life of God. Okay? He's already given it to us. So that should make you enter into rest, right? Uh, another example, Second Peter 1 and 3. You know, a while back we talked about being born again, how that it's not just receiving a new spirit, it's a new soul and ultimately a new body. Born again, when a baby is born, a baby is born with a spirit, a soul, and a body. And the same with us. We're born, when we're born again, we're first of all born with a spirit. Through our obedience to the truth, our soul is born again, and ultimately we're going to receive a new body, you see. We are going to be a total born again personality. Well, the thing is, God says here in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy begat us again. That's the same word for born again, by the way. He begat us again. First Peter 1 and 3. He begat us again. Past tense. Unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see when you were born again? is when Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's when you were born. Spirit, soul, and body. Everything that you everything that you needed happened when Christ was resurrected from the dead. You were given resurrection life. You were given Christ likeness. You were given perfection. You were given maturity. All that happened before you were ever born. In the mind of God. In the works of God. It was finished. That's why Jesus said it is finished. Remember him saying that? He also said, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Be happy because I've already overcome the world. Right? Another one. Let's see. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. You'll never fail to receive what you need from God if you understand this. If you don't understand this, you're going to be looking for something that's coming in the future, and it will never come. The reason is, tomorrow never comes. You ever notice that? The devil loves for us to get into a cycle of procrastination, thinking that God's going to do something tomorrow. Well, that's not what the Bible says. God wants us to believe that what he's done was done in the past, not tomorrow. 
If you're believing God's going to do something tomorrow, you're believing wrong. Your faith is not according to the word. The devil is going to conquer you in this warfare. Ephesians 1 and 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, hath blessed us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That's, listen, this is the reason we have authority over our circumstances. And we have authority over the curse, right? Well, look in Galatians. Go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. You don't have to beg God about any curse that's upon your life. All you got to do is come into agreement with the Word. Christ redeemed us. You know what that word redeemed is? It's the word exogorazo, and it means to buy a slave with his freedom in mind. You're buying somebody who's in bondage in order to set them free. That's what the word means. And the Bible says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He bought us to set us free from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? The curse of the law is the curse that the law pronounced upon the disobedient. And, it, and it's in every area and every facet of people's lives. In every circumstance around their life. The curse of the law is those things which are detrimental to our life and to prosperity and to blessings. That's what the curse of the law is. Now, what does it say about it? It says, Christ redeemed us, past tense, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. All of our curse was put upon Jesus. God wants us to enter into rest concerning any curse whether it be in our body, whether it be in our mind, whether it be demon spirits, whether it be circumstances, makes no difference. God wants us to rest concerning the curse. The reason is, is his word says he's already taken care of. He wants us to rest. He wants us to come into agreement with him. Okay, again, let me say it. He wants us to rest, but his word gives us authority over the curse. You should be exercising authority over the curse. It doesn't matter what the curse is. It makes no difference. You have authority over the curse. According to the word of God. That's why Jesus went around doing what he did. Destroying the works of the devil, the Bible says. Because he had authority over the curse. He gave us authority over the curse. So you don't have to be anxious or troubled about any curse on your life. Whatever you consider a curse. On your life. Don't be anxious and troubled about it. Jesus bore that curse. That curse was put upon him. That's why we get healing. That's why we get all the blessings of God. That's why God supplies our needs. That's why God heals our animals. That's why God uh, uh, takes the moles out of our yard. That's why God heals our plants when we pray for them. That's why God does everything that God does. He does it because we have a legal right to it in the scripture. A legal right. When we see a promise that's past tense like this one, we know that we have authority over this situation in front of us, this curse in front of us, whatever it is. We've got authority over it. We should rest because there is no problem. The problem's been taken care of. There is no problem. And we have authority to come against this because, according to the cross, we've been delivered from it. Okay? Another one I like in particular is Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Your old life was put to death. You don't have to obey sin because your old life was put to death. You see that? If you really believe that, if you really believe this word, you don't have to obey sin. You have dominion over sin. You have dominion over the devil. You have dominion over the curse. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live. Now, if you really believe that, you don't worry about getting dressed up to meet the bridegroom. 
And it's no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. And that life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith. The faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So the life that we do live in this flesh, we live in faith. And what is faith? Faith is the substance of the thing hoped for while there's no evidence seen. Faith is believing you have something that cannot be seen. That's what faith is. Yes, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is believing you have received, like Jesus said, when you don't even see it. And that, God says, is the substance of the thing hoped for. The substance. In other words, it's the thing that God makes the thing hoped for out of. It's the substance of the thing hoped for. You should rest because your very faith is the thing that God is going to make the substance out of. Uh, where he talked about Asa, where the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth, searching for those whose heart is perfect towards him. For the eyes of the Lord search. Verse uh, 9, uh, 16, Second Chronicles 16 and 9. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. In other words, he wants to show himself strong. He delights to show himself strong. No matter what your problem is, Jesus is your Savior. Right? Look at Colossians. Let me point out this. The devil has been conquered. It's not up to us to conquer him. He's been conquered. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, Scripture says, Giving thanks unto the Father who made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. You know, have you ever worried about your ability? Have you ever worried about your ability to be a partaker with the blessings of the saints? Sometimes you think you're not your faith isn't strong enough or whatever. Well, just remember what the scripture says. You know, uh, it's no more I to live as Christ lives in me. If Christ lives in you, his faith lives in you. Do you believe that? The, the, we have, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now that's a word of faith, isn't it? Well, we have the faith of Christ. We have the love of Christ. We have the great, we have all that. Everything that Christ was is ours. As a free gift. If you believe it, you will enter into it. As you believe it, you will enter into it. And right here he tells us, he made us able to partake of the inheritance that he gave to the saints. Who delivered us, and not only the saints, but the saints in light. That means the saints who are walking in the light. Okay? Uh, who delivered us out of the power of darkness. Again, past tense. He delivered us out of the power of darkness. If you believe that you're under the power of darkness, you're not believing the gospel, and you're not going to enter into the rest, and you're not going to exercise authority over the power of darkness. Why did Jesus send out his disciples? He didn't go with them. He sent them out. First he sent the twelve, then he sent the seventy. Go on out and go, don't go in the way of the Gentiles, but go in the way of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and pray for the sick, and raise the dead. Cast out demons. He sent them out with this authority to do it. Well, he gives us that authority too. We have the authority because we've been delivered out of the power of darkness. And all Christians have. We've got authority that if another Christian believes and trusts in God, we exercise our authority in their life if they believe. Like Jesus did. Jesus exercised authority. He sent his disciples to exercise authority in places where people believed. Because if any two agree. It shall be done, the Bible says. You can't exercise authority in somebody else's life when they don't believe. You can exercise authority in your life when you believe, but you can exercise authority in another person's life when they believe. Can two, can two exercise authority in the area? Well, you know, yeah, we have examples of that. For instance, the, in the Scriptures, God exercised faith when somebody who had authority in another person's life had faith. Like the centurion, or like the Syrophoenician woman, uh, he healed the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman because of her faith. He healed the centurion's servant because of his faith. 
So, you know, when we've got authority in somebody else's life, you know, like, like if our children, our own children, you know, that they're being raised up in our household, we've got authority. It doesn't matter that they don't believe. They don't have to exercise faith to be healed. We have to exercise faith for them to be healed. They will be healed. If they're under our authority, God counts that as our authority. Or if you have an, uh, if you have an elderly um, parent, you know, that's in your house that um, is not necessarily under the dominion of Christ in their own mind and their own thinking, you can exercise authority. The Lord showed me that. Uh, because you're their authority. You're responsible for them. God makes you responsible for them, so you can exercise authority. Well, today, if he was to talk to us today, he would say, to go to the church, not to go to the pagans. That's what he would say. Because the, he called it the children's bread. You don't cast the children's bread to the dogs. You preach the gospel to the pagans, but the deliverance and everything from the curse, that's for the children. You know, if a pagan becomes a Christian, they are in line for deliverance from the curse and every other blessing that God has. Okay? I know a lot of people would disagree with that, but that's just Bible. When we go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, we're talking about going to Christians. And the reason he calls them lost sheep is because they've lost their way. Many Christians have lost their way. They don't know the way. Maybe, maybe God's given us the way in some area of our lives, but he hasn't given them the way, and they don't know the way yet. And you can help show them the way. You can bring them to the way. You know? It's an excuse, and it's the gospel that they've heard. The gospel that they've heard is that you can't be perfect, but it's not God's gospel. We're to confess that we're not even alive anymore. Christ lives in us. And uh, Jesus said to us, Be ye therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. He commanded us to be perfect. Perfect is perfect is just um, obeying what you know God wants you to do. We can do that. We have the ability. Since we're not under the power of darkness anymore, if we believe that and we remember that and we cast down these other voices and these other imaginations, we can walk with God. We have been given the power to walk with God. It's the false gospel. It's the antichrist gospel that says that. That you're always going to be in bondage to sin. You're never going to be an overcomer. You never can be perfect. You know, the word perfect just means mature. It means full grown. It means, and there's no verse that says what they say. Not one. No, and it won't even cause you to overcome the problem at hand. Much less get to heaven. You can't overcome the problem at hand if you don't believe that you can overcome it. The promises in the Bible are to the overcomers. I can tell you this. God said in Peter that he was going to shake everything that could be shaken. And he also said that just like Noah entered into that boat and eight were saved. You know what Noah means? Noah, the word Noah is rest in the Hebrew. It's rest. You know who entered into that boat and was saved from the flood? The people who were in the rest. The family of the rest. See? And th there's a flood coming in this country. We need to enter into the rest now. That's how we prepare the tower that the Lord is showing us. You know? That's how we prepare the, the ark for the flood that's coming. We're building an ark. And that ark is for the people of rest. The people who enter into the rest. A person who's in rest, they don't have anything to worry about. A people who believe these scriptures, they don't have anything to worry about. Because they're not only believing, they're entering into obedience too. You know, faith of that works again. The key to the ability to obey the scriptures is the belief in the scriptures. The voice. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Be obedient about everything you hear from God. You might think it's small and insignificant and not important, but God is trying you in the wilderness to see what you're going to do with his voice. You may think it's not important. You may think, well, nobody else does that. But if God showed it to you, he said, if you shall hear his voice. He didn't say if they heard his voice. He said, if you heard his voice, did you hear his voice? If he showed you something that he wants you to do, and you hear his voice, you're going to be tried. And you're not going to enter into his rest if you don't obey, because you're not seeking from your works if you don't obey. I don't care how much you justify yourself and say everybody else is not doing it. 
Well, I'd be all by myself if I did do it. It don't make any difference. You can do it. See, we're going through this trial in the wilderness. We're listening to the Lord. We're hearing the voice of God. You may hear something other people don't hear. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you know something is right, you know it's in the Word, you're responsible. If you know it, so you're responsible. Aaron heard another voice, and he heard the voice of a multitude. That's what he heard. We can't, if we hear the voice of the multitude, we're sure not hearing the voice of the Lord, because the multitude aren't following the Lord. This is why the Bible says, seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You can't trust what the multitude are doing. Aaron built the golden calf because of the opinion of the multitude. Well, as I shared with you a while back, the churches built their own golden calf. They're false gods. They're false Christ. And it was because of what the multitude wanted. Look at John chapter 12 and verse 31. For those who want to disobey the voice of the Lord and store up their treasures, let them let them get ripped off because they're not obeying God. You know, it's fine with me. Verse 31, John chapter 12, verse 31. Pay attention to what Jesus says. I mean, sometimes it doesn't make sense to you, but if you just meditate on it, You'll see he's saying something significant. And I think he's saying something really significant here. Now is the judgment of this world. And now shall the prince of this world be cast out. See, do you believe that? Do you believe that the devil has no more power in this earth, no more authority in this earth? Well, it's only for those that believe it, right? What happened at the cross is the prince of this world was cast out. And the world was judged. Doesn't he say in John chapter 3 that the world is judged already because they haven't believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God? Yeah, they're already judged. You know people when they die, they go to one place or the other, don't they? That's because they're already judged. And listen, the devil is already cast out. And that's why we can speak with authority because his power is totally taken away. Do you know in Revelation chapter 12 where they warred against the Satan, uh, Satan and his Demons, it says they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they loved not their life unto death. Their testimony, the word of their testimony. That was uh, Revelation 12 and 11. See, their testimony, their confession. They overcame the devil because of the blood of the Lamb, something that's happened in the past. Right? Because the word of their testimony, because they're agreeing with what's happened in the past, <laughs> and because they love not their life. Luke 11 and verse 20. Mm -hmm. I think it happened when Christ went to the cross. You know, because that's what he said, it is finished. And that's what he was talking about when he said, I've overcome the world. You know what? We have authority to cast him out because he was cast out. We became born again because we were born again. You see that? We received the blessings that are stored up for us in heavenly places because they were given to us through Christ Jesus. Everything that happens now happens because it's been accomplished. Okay? Verse 20, just to prove it, it says, But if, if, if I by the finger of God cast out demons, then is the kingdom of God come upon you. When the strong man, and he's talking about Satan here, when the strong man, fully armed, guardeth his own court, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him his whole armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. Now that was Jesus. The Bible says Jesus took from him his whole armor that he trusted in. He's got no armor. And not only that, he expects something from us. Since he's taken away his armor and made him totally defenseless, he expects something from us. He says in verse 23, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. <laughs> if you're not gathering the spoils, of Satan's kingdom, you're going to be scattered. That's what he said. A person who will not gather 
the spoils of Satan's kingdom will scatter. And the word scatter there means it's kind of like um, because of the enemy is coming against you, you're scattering. You're on the run instead of him being on the run. What we're taking away from Satan is his kingdom. We, we, we are plundering his kingdom. Every time a soul comes into the kingdom of heaven, they came out of the kingdom of this world. Uh, every time you get health, or as you had sickness, you're plundering his kingdom. Because this is the gift that was given to us, Ephesians 1 and 3, or 1 Peter 1 and 3, in heavenly places. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness in the heavens. It's ours. We're plundering his kingdom. We're taking from him. He, uh, eventually, it's going to come to such a state that in Romans chapter 11, I mean, excuse me, Revelation chapter 11, it says the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's going to take over. And we, we, he taught us to pray the prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's a command. It's not a request. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, we have the authority to command that. Why do we have the authority to command that? Well, right here, Satan was conquered, his armor was taken away, and his spoils are left out there to be taken. And we are commanded to take the spoil. And if we don't take his spoil, then we're not, actually what we're not doing is we're not entering into the kingdom. We're spoiling, when the, listen, when the old man is decaying, and the new man is being renewed day by day. What are you doing? You're spoiling his kingdom. This kingdom right here used to belong to Satan. And if the spiritual man is not growing, you're not spoiling his kingdom. Because the spiritual man and the carnal man live in the same house and occupy one territory. Therefore, the carnal man has to die for the spiritual man to take his house. You take it, you're spoiling Satan's kingdom. You're robbing his kingdom. And when we go out there and we minister the life of Christ to other people, we are robbing his kingdom. We are plundering his kingdom for Christ. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We got the authority to do that, you see, because of what Jesus did right there. The flesh being the old carnal nature. First Corinthians chapter 1. Share with you just one more thing here. First Corinthians chapter one. The Lord has given us just one method to conquer Satan's kingdom. He doesn't accept your method. He doesn't accept religion's method. He doesn't accept, accept the world's method. He only accepts the sacrifice of Christ. And since you've got to cease from your works when you believe the promise of God, if the promise is past tense and you believe it. You've got to stop from your works. You see? Because it's already done. If you believe it's already done, you're going to stop. You're going to cease. And so he tells us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God chose in verse 28 the base things of the world and the things that are despised did God choose and the things that are not that he might bring to naught the things that are. So God only chooses the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. He only uses the things that aren't to bring to nothing the things that are. That's all he uses. That's all God will use is the things that aren't. That's all he wants the Christian to use. That's all Jesus used. Jesus used the things that were not to bring to nothing the things that were. He didn't use methods. He didn't use, you know, I, one time I asked the Lord, Lord, what about the mud that Jesus used in the eye of the guy that was blind? And I got an answer so quick, it, it shocked him. And he told me that he had to wash that mud out of his eye to get rid of his blindness. It wasn't the mud that gave him healing. It was getting the mud out of his eye that gave him healing. You know what the mud symbolizes? The old fleshly earth. I mean, that's what mud is. It's ice earth. Carnal thinking, carnal seeing, carnal seeing. The dirt, earth, man. What's a man? You know? Yeah. It, it wasn't the mud that healed his eye. 
It was getting the mud out of his high heels. You know? And so it's not, oh, uh, yeah, well, what about the spittle that came out of Jesus' mouth? He spit on one guy's tongue and loosed his tongue. Well, that's what the Bible says. What comes out of the mouth of God. Every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Spittle out of Jesus represented what came out of his mouth. You see? So God wants us to see the sacrifice. See, God didn't, wasn't using methods. There's nothing magic in spittle. You can spit all over people and just make them mad at you. You know, they'll just get mad at you. <laughs> it's not the spittle. It's, 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 it's what comes out of the mouth of God. If you use what comes out of the mouth of God, you get the same results Jesus got. And if you get the mud out of people's eyes, you get the same results. Deliver them from their blindness. If you can get the mud out of their eyes, you see. So it's not it's not the things that are, it's the things that are not. What are the things that are not? We just read all those verses. All of them that said something had happened that we don't see. We've got every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. The old man is dead. The new man is alive. We're delivered from the curse. All of those promises are past tense, and yet we don't see them. So if you confess them, you're confessing something that is not. You see that? You're confessing something that you do not see. This is God's method. All right. So some people say, well, maybe God's method today, maybe he gives wisdom to psychiatrists to help us to be delivered of our sinful passions, you know. But a psychiatrist is something that is. He's not something that is not. And the money that you pay him certainly is. It's not something that is not. <laughs> and the doctor that you go to to pay for your healing, which is supposed to be free, uh, is certainly something that is and, some, and is not something that is not. But the Word of God is something that is not. By His stripes you were healed. That's something that is not. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4 and verse 17 that faith calls the things that be not as though they were. So I, I have so many people, and some of you probably said the same thing. Well, that's lying. When you say something that is not true in the physical realm, that's a lie. No, that's not a lie. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. The things that are not are forever. The things that are seen, they're very temporary. They're going to pass away. Everything that can be shaken is going to destroy the things that are seen. As of things that are made, the scripture says. God's going to destroy everything that is, of, that is made. So God's method for destroying the curse and destroying the things that are, which is the curse, right, is the things that are not. He doesn't have another method. If you're using another method, it's not God's method. You haven't ceased from your works if you're using another method. Jesus just spoke things. That's all he did. He didn't give these people ingenuity about what they should eat to give them help. He didn't send them to a better doctor to give them help. He just spoke them into hell. That's his method for us. We ought to agree with the word of God. We are healthy. He didn't send Dr. Luke to take care of it. <laughs> As some apostate preachers are preaching in this area, you know. No, he didn't do none of that. He used the things that are not. If you use the things that are not, you can't pay for your salvation. Then it's grace. If you're healed because you speak, the word of God, then you can't, you're not paying anything for it. <laughs> However, like I was saying a while ago, some people's idea of prayer is a payment. It's, it's salvation by works because you're thinking that God's only going to hear you if you earn it by enough prayer and enough fervency and enough, you know, all those things. That's not true. All you've got to do is believe what you pray. All you've got to do is believe what the word of God says and pray in agreement and accept it. Prayer, really prayer is only for one reason. So that your mind can get in agreement with what the Word says. And you can accept it. That's right. Because the Bible says, in 1 John 5, here it is again. It's the same exact thing. In verse 14, this is the boldness 
which we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. Now, do you, does he say you have to speak particularly loud or particularly long? No, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you. Does, does it matter if you feel like he hears you? No, it doesn't matter if you feel like he hears you. It doesn't make any difference. It makes no difference whatsoever what you feel like. It says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we've asked of him. It's already ours. In other words, God has determined for us to see this because he says it in so many different ways and in so many verses. He wants us to believe that our prayers are answered. Why? So you can walk in the rest all of the time. That's what the rest is. The rest is abiding in Christ because you believe his word. Of course, if you believe the rest is, you know, what we were talking about earlier, you know, a day or, or anything like that, well, then you're... You can quench my thirsting soul Purest water make me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh, Jesus, I trust in you Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in